Welcome to Mr. Corrigan's AP European History Screencast. My first attempt at screencasting. You guys are in on the ground floor. Hopefully there will be more to come if this is in any way educational and enjoyable. Um, so stay tuned. But for now, I'm going to have a screencast on the origins of World War I. The textbook only gives you a little bit of information on the build up to World War I. So I plan to fill in some background information for you, my students. Notable podcaster Dan Carlin points to the lead up to the First World War as one of those times when one person changes the course of history. And in many ways, he's right. On June 28, 1914, Gavrilo Princip shot the heir to the Austrian throne, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, in Sarajevo, Bosnia. A month later, what will be known as the Great War and later World War I began. By 1917, much of the world was involved in the conflict in some manner or another. And by the end of the war in 1918, Europe and the world had been forever changed. Of course, the assassination did not occur in a vacuum. and It was only one reason for creating a war that would ultimately claim the lives of 15 million or more people. There was a lot going on in the decades leading up to the summer of 1914. So let's try to pin down some of those causes of World War I. Where to begin? Well, let's start with an acronym. Maniacs. Maniacs stands for militarism, alliances, nationalism, imperialism, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, conflict and crises in the Balkans, and a series of diplomatic failures. Not to be confused, um, 10,000 Maniacs, the uh, wonderful band from the 1980s and early 90s, um, but you guys have probably never heard of them. Let's start with militarism. Militarism refers to the buildup of arms and armies and navies heading into uh, you know, any conflict, really. But uh, in particular, we focus, obviously, on the late 19th century and early 20th century in this case. The rapid pace of military uh, innovation caused guns and ships uh, to um, improve their... Uh, destructive power at an amazing rate uh, head, heading into uh, the 1900s and then heading again into World War I. Uh, there were some countries that were calling for limited buildup, uh, namely Russia, uh, and that was mainly because they wanted to avoid war and avoid getting embarrassed in war because they could not afford to keep up with the Joneses when it came to military technology. Uh, but w in particular, I'm going to focus uh, a little bit on the buildup of uh, navies and, and guns, uh, gunboats in particular, uh, between Britain and Germany. You know, For example, Barbara Tuckman. Uh, who wrote The Guns of August, one of the foremost um, authorities on World War I and the build-up to the war, talks about Kaiser Wilhelm II. And uh, Kaiser Wilhelm uh, is uh, desperate for Germany to join the other great European nations as a great power. So uh, I'm going to read to you a uh, selection from Barbara Tuckman's The Guns of August about Kaiser Wilhelm II and his desire to join with the great powers, and, and that being a great motivator for his buildup of his armies and his navy in particular. Envy of the older nations gnawed at him, uh, at Kaiser Wilhelm II. He complained to Theodore Roosevelt that the English nobility on continental tours never visited Berlin, but always went to Paris. He felt unappreciated. All the long years of my reign, he told the King of Italy, my colleagues, the monarchs of Europe, have paid no attention to what I have to say. Soon, with my great navy to endorse my words, they will be more respectful. The same sentiments ran through his whole nation, which suffered, like their emperor, from a terrible need for recognition, pulsing with energy and ambition, conscious of strength, fed upon Nitschke and Tritschke. They felt entitled to rule and cheated that the world did not acknowledge their title. We must, wrote Friedrich von Bernhardi, the spokesman of militarism, secure German nationality and German spirit throughout the globe, that high esteem which is due them and has hitherto been withheld from them. So you get a sense that there's a little bit of an inferiority complex amongst the Germans, and that's a big reason why um, they, they challenge uh, the British on the high seas in particular. And this will build up tensions leading into World War I. 
Uh, there was a naval arms race, in particular focusing on the Dreadnought, this, this gunship in which um, they used all big guns. This was a steam-powered vessel. This was a powerful vessel. Uh, and according to Alfred Thayer Mahan, um, great powers controlled the seas. And this was a, a military theory of the day. If you wanted to be a great power, you had to control the seas. If you wanted to control the seas, you needed to have coaling stations across the globe so that your mighty navy could uh, fuel up in coal wherever it went. So that meant you needed um, outposts or colonies wherever uh, your ships were going to travel. Uh, and this is a political cartoon that says, you know, the Kaiser on the left here, you can tell by his wonderful mustache, uh, going up against John Bull, the um, personification of uh, England, uh, saying, well, I raise you three dreadnoughts. And John Bull says, uh, I raise you three more. And this is how it went, one side trying to outdo the other. Uh, leading up to World War I, we have a system of alliances created, uh, or you know, some will refer to them as mutual defense agreements. If I'm attacked, then you have to come to my aid. Uh, so we have the Triple Alliance on one side, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy, and the Triple Entente on the other, Great Britain, France, and Russia. Uh, Otto von Bismarck, uh, the uh, Chancellor of Germany under Kaiser Wilhelm I back in the 1870s and 1880s, had originally wanted Austria, Hungary, and Russia to link up with Germany, and he was um, successful in doing so, largely because he wanted to isolate France, that longtime rival of, of the Germans. But Austria, Hungary, and Russia couldn't decide on who should ultimately control the Balkans, so that alliance fell apart, and Germany and Austria, Hungary were forced to recruit Italy, um, and, and then eventually France Great Britain and Russia will um, link up in the Triple Entente, basically a friendly agreement, a mutual defense agreement uh, against the uh, what will become known as the Central Powers, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy, as you can see, occupying the center of Europe. Now, the important thing about alliances is if, if, if a war starts, then other countries will be pulled into uh, the fray, meaning... Um, a conflict between Serbia and Austria-Hungary, which could be just a small little regional war, ends up pulling in Germany and Russia and France and Great Britain, and then ultimately Italy, although um, confusingly they join on the other side, but we'll get to that later. Then we have nationalism. Nationalism is this national feelings of um, pride in one's country, um, there were a lot of feelings of inferiority among some nations, especially as we heard from uh, from the German side. There was superiority from other great powers. Uh, these nationalist desires for independence among ethnic groups within multi-ethnic empires, for example, within the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, Germany was pursuing colonies overseas in the name of nationalism. France sought to win back Alsace-Lorraine, those provinces that they had lost in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. And then we had several ethnic groups, including the Slavs, who desired to be free of Austro-Hungarian rule. And all of this is going to lead to a buildup of tension. We also have this idea of jingoism, which is an extreme form of nationalism. Um, jingoism um, often it takes the form of an a, extremely aggressive or warlike foreign policy. Um, and uh, it, it glorified war. And this was fairly unique to the um, the time period leading up to World War I. People like Teddy Roosevelt uh, believed that war molded men into great men, or boys into men, I guess. Um, and it also molded countries into great nations. Yeah, the term jingoism comes from this British song, we don't want to fight, but by jingo, if we do, We've got the ships, we've got the men, and we've got the money too. Jingo being a stand-in for Jesus, but by Jesus if we do. Uh, imperialism went hand-in-hand hand with nationalism. Uh, again, this was what great powers did, was to carve up colonies around the world, po uh, points or posts. Um, you know, Like I, I mentioned earlier, Alfred Thayer Mahan uh, believed that coaling stations around the world were vital to um, naval power. Um, and, and, and naval power was vital to becoming a great nation. Um, so control of 
colonies, control straits. Uh, in many cases, the best defense is an aggressive offense. Uh, large, well-armed ships that can go on the offensive. Uh, and, and so great powers divide up China. Uh, China. Uh, this is a political cartoon showing the United Kingdom and Germany. Uh, Russia, France, and Japan all sitting around a table carving up uh, China. And then, of course, we had the scramble for Africa in the late 19th century. And that's what leads to um, Africa going from this, where we have some coastal colonies, to this, basically being um, more or less entirely colonized by European powers. Of course, the spark that ignited the war was the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Uh, this happened in Sarajevo, Bosnia on June 28, 1914. He was the heir to the Austrian throne, and this gave a, the Austrians a, a reason to go to war with Serbia, um, something that they had long sought. You know, this was a chance to wipe Serbia from the map. Of course, once Austria-Hungary goes after Serbia, then the dominoes start to tip over. Other countries get involved in the conflict due to a system of alliances, and the rest, as they say, is history. And of course, the assassination in the Balkans um, by the Serbian nationalist Gavrilo Princip had to do with the conflict that had and crises that had been going on in the Balkans for years. This was called the powder keg of Europe because there were all these different ethnic groups and nationalities and religions uh, that, that all converged on this tiny little Balkan peninsula in Eastern Europe. We had the Balkan Wars of the 19-teens in which former Ottoman lands had been split up amongst these um, you know, smaller Balkan nations, uh, which created a lot of ill will as some countries got more territory than others. You had Serbia who wanted to create a, a Serbian kingdom, a pan-Slavic nationalist empire. Um, and of course, Austria-Hungary encroaches on that dream by annexing Bosnia and Herzegovina um, way back in the early uh, 1900s, 1908. And the Serbians were looking for revenge for that. And that's where the assassination ultimately uh, comes into play. Is that, uh, It's basically on the anniversary of that, um, you know, some six years later. Otto von Bismarck said that the Great European War will ultimately come from some damn foolish thing in the Balkans. And that was the assassination, of course. Very prophetic. And then, of course, we have a series of unfortunate events or a series of unfortunate diplomatic events that once the assassination occurs, both sides don't rush into war, but they make it basically inevitable that war is going to happen by completely bungling any kind of negotiation leading up to uh, the end of July 1914. Every country had a plan already in place. So once the assassination happened, this system of alliances and these war strategies have been set off. You know, some of these plans had down to the minute what troops and what supplies had to get on what trains in order to get to the battlefield first. Because, of course, if you get to the battlefield f before any of your enemies, then you win and you can take more and more territory. So someone uh, could describe this as, as trying to negotiate with someone who's already pulled the pin on the hand grenade. Um, you know, and this was, according to statesman James A. Warren, a failure of great power diplomacy to prevent a war that no one wanted. Um, it's, a, it's an unfortunate uh, series of events in which uh, a number of countries ignore the fact that no one wants this war and, and they get dragged into it anyway. Once the Great War happens, once war is declared on Serbia and Austria-Hungary and Germany and so forth and so on, there's a lot of different reactions to the war. Um, we had some people feeling regret, apprehension, or unease. Um, Sir Edward Grey, the, the British um, statesman, said, The lamps are going out all over Europe, and we shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. Again, very prophetic. Um, others were excited about the war, and they said, you know, well, we'll be back before uh, the leaves fall, or we'll be back by Christmas, you know, saying those, it'll be 
three or four months and we'll be back and we'll be victorious and we'll be we'll be men we'll be great powers there is little sense of the war scale and the war's horror that will unfold and this is a factor that plays in any war the only reason that countries get involved in war in the first place is because either A, they have to, or B, they think it's going to be very short and that they are going to win. Now, of course, if you have two sides that both think it's going to be short and that they are going to win, and then uh, they go to war with one another, you know, somebody has to be wrong. And this ends up being a dragged out war over the course of four years, not four months. Others were despondent, saying that uh, there was no good reason for the war. Um, you know, they were pacifistic. They wanted to avoid war at all costs and the destruction that goes along with them. And others just said, well, you know, it is what it is. Uh, we might as well sign up for the bloody thing uh, because this is, you know, our country against theirs. And this is, a, you know, our sense of duty, our sense of nationalism and, and you know, what else are we going to do? So this gives you a little sense of how we go from um, 1914 in, in May and June with uh, you know relatively peaceful Europe to um, you know battles breaking out all across the continent and then eventually uh, extending um, to other parts of the world as well and and it will ultimately drag into play um, <clears throat> many countries and their colonies which make it a a worldwide campaign. I hope you enjoyed listening to this screencast. I hope that. Um, it was uh, helpful and um, enjoyable. I hope again, again to do this, you know, again soon. You know, give me some feedback. Let me know how you think uh, it went and and what I could do to improve. I'll uh, sign off for now and see you soon.